How did you get interested in Louise Clapp? Well, I got interested, I was doing my master's uh, at University of San Francisco, master's in writing, and one of the sections was on using primary sources. And at that point, I had no idea what a primary source was. It is original writing in its original form. And uh, so that was my project. And I decided that my character, everybody was, oh, I'm going to do so-and-so and this kind of thing. And I decided, as a new California resident, that I would want, first of all, I would choose a writer, because I was that was my path. I would choose a writer, a woman, because I would be able to identify well with a woman. And because we were new in California, I thought the way to begin to grasp state history would be with the gold rush. So I need a woman in the gold rush who wrote. <laughs> I must have put it out there because... <laughs> but then I learned about the gold rush that, you know, for every 90 men, there might be 100 or 10 women, sorry, in the beginning. So I just was going online and looking everywhere and going to libraries and that kind of thing. I went to the Livermore Public Library. We were living in Pleasanton at the time. And just going through the Gold Rush books and that sort of thing. And then I went to the reference desk and I told the reference librarian what I was doing. And, you know, she kind of thought for a while and then she said, well, there was that Shirley woman. <laughs> That Shirley woman, I'm thinking, she said, yeah, there was that woman who wrote those letters. <laughs> That's how it began. Uh, I think I checked out my first book and uh, from that library. And then reading the letters, so I felt that I had it, because I've got the letters, it's the gold rush, I've got Dame Shirley. And so I began reading, and what interested me was her descriptions of the Feather River Canyon. She was awed by the beauty, by the magnificence, by the wild grandeur, as she called it. And I was a little suspicious. Hadn't been very many exciting places in California's amazing landforms. And I thought, the way to begin this is to see if she's got it right with her descriptions of the Feather River Canyon. So we loaded our two sons in the car, and we went up to the canyon, and as we came in from north of Chico, it just was dramatic, it was amazing. And I realized she had it right, she was telling the truth. And so I felt that I could trust her version of her descriptions of what she saw, and for me, that was it. That was, uh, that was the good housekeeping seal that I was looking for. I remember she describes the very perilous journey on a mule down these precipitous trails where you could easily fall off, or the mule could, as you're going down into the, into the canyon. Yes. Hair raising. Yeah, that was a five mile ride on mule back into the canyon, and it was steep. We've been out there two or three times from the, seeing where it is from the top, and then at the bottom you can look up. Uh, it's still, there's, it's still marked, because that was the trail that was in and out for everyone. And it was incredibly steep, five miles to get down to the river, and they did that in an afternoon. It took them, I think, four hours, and they got down to Rich Bar um, by evening, early evening. And she said the miners were astounded. And she said, how did she put that about herself? I am, I myself am very vain of my having made this feat. And so she was very proud of herself that she did that. And there <laughs> she the, was. Uh, where did the pen name Dame Shirley come from? That probably came from a couple of places. The California State Library has the letters that were found after her death by a historian who did one of the first publications. Uh, not the one that uh, Kip showed you, but uh, the next one that really became the classic edition that gets passed around and you can still find it. Um, she. So those letters in the State Library are from friends and family, her mother and her girlfriends and that kind of thing. And one of them was from her mother, and it was Dear Shirley. And so I learned that that was a nickname, which was very likely. Nicknames were very popular, as now. And then Dame, I think, was her conscious choice of giving herself a title that would make her sound 
legitimate, that she was authoritative, that she was educated, she was very well educated. And so I think she put those two together and that's how she came up with Dame Shirley. And she was writing ostensibly to her sister Mary back in, in the East, but she surely, it, it's so literate, so eloquent, so articulate, she must have had publication in mind, don't you think? I do think that. Um, in her early life, um, she lost both of her parents before she was 18, so that was a very difficult thing, and she was the oldest of seven children, so yeah. as the oldest, you know, she was sort of a a mother figure, especially to the younger ones. She happened to meet a very prominent American diplomat, man of letters, they called him, um, on a stagecoach ride coming back from her aunt and uncle in Vermont. They, it was a two-day stagecoach ride, and he was impressed by her knowledge of things, and of course she was impressed by what he knew. He recited some poetry, and they, they got along splendidly. And then he looked her up in Amherst, and they began a correspondence that lasted seven years, and until his death, in fact. And he encouraged her, first of all, to write as a source of comfort during times of distress. And then, as their correspondence continued, he suggested who she should read, including uh, the European women, Madame de Sévigny, the French woman who was at the, the court of Louis XIV. I've learned a lot of history along the way myself. <laughs> and also Madame de Stahl and others. And he said several times, in fact, he'd done some essays on these women, and he sent Louise things. He sent her copies of his poetry. He sent her an essay of, that he... Uh, that he wrote about Madame de Stahl and so forth. So I think that she took it all to heart and she clearly wanted to write. So I believe that she probably followed the structure. I have not yet read the letters of Madame de Stahl. I've got about three books on my desk right now for that. <laughs> but I think that that was both her inspiration and possibly even the guidance for the structure. Mm. Now the epistolary style which she wrote in, you know, Dear Mary, and you know I'm a little thistle seed in my wandering, and you remember how I wasn't good at art and all those things, they give us a window. They tell us about Louise while she is writing to her sister describing what she is seeing. So you have that two-way uh, disclosure, and that of course is another remarkable thing so that we do get to know Louise as we go along. Before we hear more about the real Louisa, I'd love to get your impression, Julia, uh, about her. When you first encountered her, um, you were uh, called up by your agent, I presume, and said, hey, San Francisco wants you for this uh, world premiere. What were your thoughts about that? Well, as you said, I didn't know anything about Louise Clapp. Um, Peter Sellers, though, gave me some of the excerpts that he had extracted from her letters that he was considering for the libretto, and he we were in rehearsals for a piece on Simone, Simone Veil, actually. Um, and <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just I read them in the evening and I said, well, she's very bright, she's very funny, um, she's very open and receptive to every individual that she's encountered and also the environment that she entered. Um, and so I, I was super curious how Peter was going to flesh out the rest of the story, given that she was already such a rich uh, character. Um, you touched on something that's interesting to me, that, that she's very open. She's not judgmental uh, terribly, but she's extremely observant. Uh, she was critical, though. I mean, I don't, yes, I don't think yes. she shied away from <laughs> really criticizing things that uh, she didn't agree with or simply didn't understand um, from the miners themselves, uh, to the mob mentality, to the Indians that she was encounter the Native Americans that she was encountering. I mean, she's coming out of this Victorian era of wearing a lot of clothing and then being exposed to people who wore nothing at all. I mean, that was very shocking. Um, I think, I don't know if it's distressing to her, but she was disapproving <laughs> um, and, and shared it, and shared it. I mean, that, um, yeah. she, was, she was also, uh, it seems to me, very um, self-deprecating. She's not, although her language is eloquent, she's not grand herself. No, <laughs> no, yeah, it was sort of an uh, alter ego, I guess, that she took on. But, and she did admit, 
I loved in the early letters she admitted, you know, I, I'm not a great artist, so I, I have to describe, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, I have to describe this all with my words because I, I don't know how to draw. Oh, if only I knew how to draw. You know? um, <laughs> right. you, I wouldn't have to you know, waste, <laughs> waste words trying to describe it to you. And um, anyway, how lucky are we, right? <laughs> right. Um, would you talk about her relationship with her husband, uh, Marlene? Can you talk a little bit about that, Fayette? Uh, what was that? relationship. Like. Yeah, I will. Um, so when this mentor of hers, he passed away in 1847, and she married a year later, she married a young man from, I think he was from Northampton, which is near Amherst. He had um, had a, uh, what do I want to say, a, worked with his uncle who was a doctor, an internship I'm looking for. Um, so he had an internship and no doubt medical school such as it was uh, in that time. <laughs> And so he was ready to be a doctor. They probably met at Amherst. Um, his, he had friends who went there. And so they got married in uh, September of 1848. And then somewhere along the line, uh, it was December of 1848, when President Polk announced that the gold talk in California was real, that there was gold there, and people were getting it. So I kind of assumed that maybe they decided they would go. Uh, I have the feeling that in the back of Louise's mind, this would be the event that she could write about since it was just now getting started. And so I also wonder, because of the things she wrote about her husband having a hard time making money or keeping money, uh, I think, and so she put him down a few times. So I have a feeling that for her to get to California, it would be good to have an escort. It would be good to have a husband. And then that would sort of make everything easier for her. And so they married. And when they came to California, they came with two of her three younger sisters and someone in Fayette's family. So it was kind of a family group. They came on a, um, a merchant ship. So they paid passage. And they left in about September of 1849 and arrived in San Francisco in January of 1850. Oh, and then, long trip. <laughs> yeah, a long trip, a long trip. Sadly, around the horn, they came around the horn. Yeah, they came around the horn, which means that she had to have stopped maybe in Santiago and other places. And I wish we had some record of that, because Louise could have done an amazing job of describing South American cities to mm. us. Oh yeah. So they were in San Francisco for one year. Uh, Fayette was practicing medicine. But he didn't like the climate in San Francisco. It was either too cold or too windy or not Foggy. warm and sunny enough. And, uh, and of course, if you're a man who's just arrived in San Francisco, don't you want to get to the gold mines and don't you want to get rich, which was the dream. So he did, uh, he did persuade Louise that he should go up and see if it would be a safe uh, environment for her. His friends told him, go to Rich Bar because it's barely been discovered. And there's only one doctor there right now. So that is how that played out. And they separated. He went first. So she met him in Mary, Marysville and then was going to meet up again at Bidwell's Bar, which is now under... Um, the Oroville Dam, and that's she. So her first letter describes that springless, horrific wagon that you know they bounced their way through the rocky Northern California Valley and got to uh, Bidwell's Bar, and then they met up and got on mule back, and away they went. And that's where we meet Ned Peters, this uh, um, former slave who uh, is driving this wagon. Um, can you talk a little bit about their relationship, and then I want to get Julia to chime in on that as well. Yes, so they hired him, which gives you also a sense of Louise's background and what she was accustomed to or decided she was going to stay accustomed to. Uh, he became their cook at, um, at Rich Bar, and I think she got to know him well. He was a good cook. She learned about her back, his background and then, of course, saw the treatment that he received, which finally drove him out of camp. So she was very sympathetic. He was uh, a as, violinist, right, as, as well? She pardon him, me? He was a violinist. She called him Paganini. Yes, yeah, she called Ned. him Ned Paganini. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she didn't say too much about how often he played, but that had to be a wonderful thing. And she, I think, was aware of classical music and composers and that sort of thing. So, so she, liked, uh, she liked being able to tell that about him, which was, you know, that's quite an accomplishment for anyone. And, um, and well, let's... 
ask Julie about this first. In the, in the production, Peter has kind of given us a hint that the relationship between um, Ned and Shirley, there's an affection there that Fayette resents, quite obviously. Can you talk about it's, it's an opera, I mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, can you talk a little bit how that developed in the in the process of uh, there's, there's nothing in the libretto that suggests this. But. No, I mean I, Peter. Peter admits he wanted to create some love dynamics, and mm. because it is an opera, um, <laughs> so I mean there was clearly a lot of affection that uh, Louise had for Ned, and also a respect for him. I mean she. I love that there's several men that she talks about in the letters um, who either were great orators or very well read. And um, it's like she characterizes some of these individuals in the most <laughs> wonderful, warm way. Um, and Ned, I think she respected very much because of his culinary um, expertise and uh, because of his beautiful, you know, his violin playing, um, which actually isn't isn't in the opera. We don't, uh, P uh, John decided he didn't, <laughs> he didn't want to allude to playing the violin because he didn't want to have to have Devon <laughs> play the violin on stage. <laughs> See, the, uh, the, on the administrative side, we breathed a great sigh of relief when we found out that Ned didn't have to play the violin on stage. <laughs> right, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to find anyone to play the violin well, and let alone a baritone. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and miming it, of course, it never quite works. So that's, that's no, awesome. no, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's that's... Yeah, um, so there's it, it, certainly she describes him in the, in her letters w with a, a, a great deal of admiration. I think she was, she expressed terrible regret when he left, mm -hmm. but there's no hint of of any kind of sort of love triangle there that you would detect. In, in no, the there no no hint. There's no hint of any love triangle or even almost love in um, <laughs> yeah, no. in the Shirley letter. So we're left to wonder about that. Before we go on, let's. I've got a little one minute video clip of um, Julia's first scene. So let's watch. Which that. I have not seen, and I hope I don't get mad oh, at you for it's playing great. it. It's great. I'm closing my ears. Okay. You have no idea of the hand to mouth sort of style in which most men in this country are in the habit of living. You have no idea. Gold. Some say that I ought to be put into a straight jacket. Some say I was undoubtedly mad to think of such a thing as putting him. <laughs> okay. Just a little tantalization for you there. <laughs> We have several performances left if you want to. Uh, <laughs> um, seeing the elephant, I had not known that expression before reading it uh, in Dame Shirley, but I guess it was a fairly common one uh, during her time. Yes, when I was uh, associate editor of California History, of course it came up in so many things, and finally I thought, I need to know what that means. <laughs> and during, <laughs> as a good editor, you should know what you're editing. <laughs> and so during the 19th century, people were beginning to travel to Europe and, and at more exotic places. You know, there was kind of a, um, a sort of a metaphysical draw for many Europeans to go to India, in fact, and other places. And seeing the elephant, you would see elephants in India, Southeast Asia, and so forth. And then when circus became kind of a mainstream uh, recreational thing in America, there were elephants, there were tigers. And so people would say, if they'd gone to the circus, I've seen the elephant. And it became the sort of um, icon for seeing something very unusual that not everybody would see. And that's, so that's how, it, uh, that's how it came into mainstream when people talked about going to the gold rush or coming back. I have seen the elephant. In fact, I ran across, there's a, a book I haven't read yet about women in the gold rush called They Saw the Elephant. 
So it obviously was an uh, mm. expression in, in common use. Julia, what's it like to, to actually sing um, Dame Shirley's language uh, in the, in, to the notes of John Adams? <laughs> Does it sing itself well, do you think? Uh, I'm <laughs> John demands that his singers, or at least I've, I have found, demands that I be very concentrated and very clear. <laughs> like, um, and my the goal always is about communicating as directly as possible and being as articulate as possible. Um, and which is wonderful because I actually I don't I don't have time to think about oh how, how are people receiving me and my voice. I mean I don't there's no time. Um, it's just quick fire parlando and uh, yeah, it's actually, how did you get connected with John? He he uh, uh, as I, we will attest insisted that you be engaged to create this role. How did the two of you know each other? Um, I, I met him in October of 2014, and um, I had a, like a 30, 40 minute meeting with him uh, to talk about me singing El Nino, actually. And, um, this is uh, oratorio about the about Christmas. It's just one of the greatest pieces of music of all time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I sang repertoire from Messiaen to Oscar Brown to some Josephine Baker tunes. And then we talked for a while and just had a very easy exchange. I mean, um, I think we always sort of understood each other. Um, and yeah, then within the week, uh, his managers called mine and said, would, would she like to record Dr. Atomic with BBC? Would she like to sing El Nino? And also, would she like to be uh, the lead in this new opera? Um, <laughs> it all came at once. Wow. <laughs> would you like to spend the next three years with John Adams? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Essentially. And, I, and I, all the other first thing I said to my manager was, I'm going to be atoms out, I think. Um, but um, I'm so glad that I've, over the course of these past 12 months, um, been able to get immersed in his repertoire and these three large pieces, which are va have vastly different musical languages, but I do feel are reflective of the uh, material. Yeah. And you do... Um... Uh, Kitty Oppenheimer and again next summer. This will be the first time on stage when you do it in Correct, Santa Fe. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious if, if uh, since you know that role now, having recorded it, how do these two compare, in, in just in terms of musically uh, as dramatically? Yeah. Well, um, they're both very bright. <laughs> uh, Louise Clapp, though, I mean, she's speaking for her. These are Louise Clapp's words. Peter selected. Um, uh, poetry to represent Kitty Oppenheimer in this opera. Um, Ariel in the, Rukeyser, exactly. Yeah, so and, wonderful um, poet. Fantastic poet. Um, one thing that I'll say for both Muriel and for Louise, I'm talking about them so casually here, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, they don't ab compartmentalize or abandon any part of themselves. It's like all of their politics, their philosophy, their um, passion, um, their spirituality that is fully incorporated into every piece. So into every, it's not organized really neatly. And I, um, it's a very fluid, deep, <laughs> rolling kind of experience. And I, I um, as a singer, it's super satisfying to have that very quick metabolized um, material, yeah. So to you're, just you're gnaw really on the whole person there. <laughs> yeah, in, absolutely, in the midst absolutely. Of all this. Yeah. Uh, we want to eventually give uh, the audience a chance to uh, ask questions of you, but uh, before we do that, let's talk about the rest of the Dame Shirley story. What happens after she leaves the the gold company, uh, gold camps? Well, they left because it was going to be two things. It was going to be a very rough winter. It was predicted to be very snowy if they didn't get out right away in the fall, they would be stuck there. And other miners had already left. The place was abandoned and it was littered and it was you know, just what we don't like to see at a campground today. Um, but they, so they got back to San Francisco in, uh, so basically January of 1853. And 
And again, I think we have a sense that this is not a marriage that they're going to work on. And so by 1854, as the San Francisco public school system was getting organized, Louise would make a perfect teacher. So she became one of the early school teachers in San Francisco, and that was her career. Her husband, Fayette, um, after they got a divorce, we don't know when he left for Hawaii, but he went to Hawaii. And then just shortly after that, the Civil War broke out, and he became a Civil War physician, contracted something, although he had he married and he had children. So and again, that's a, um, for me, that's a clue that he wanted to be a family man, that that was, that was his life plan. Uh, so Louise stayed in San Francisco. She became friends with a couple of her students, particularly who were writers. And then when she retired in 1878, she went to New York. Uh, her, her two sisters who came to California both had a tragic end. One of them died on the ship. The youngest of the two died on the ship. The other one had one daughter in San Francisco and uh, giving birth to her second daughter died in childbirth. So, and the, but the niece who survived was Genevieve Stebbins, and she got into an artistic movement called the Del Sartre movement, which at the turn of the century was kind of an early gymnasium movement that had, that had begun in Europe. And Genevieve was doing things in New York, I don't know what kind of theater, but so Louise and Genevieve were in New York together, and also Louise had very close friends who had been in San Francisco. She became an Episcopalian while she was here, and that friend, Ferdinand Ewer and his wife, they were lifelong friends in California. She stayed with them for a while. She apparently gave some public lectures on um, art, architecture, and literature. There are copies of her notebooks that show that she intended to do that. And also she wrote a critical article for a woman's college in Canada. She wrote, uh, that's a story I can't get into, but we'll, you know, it'll show, it'll come out in print one of these days. There's an article there somewhere, right? <laughs> there, yes, I hope to do a, a fuller biography because I know so much more now. So she stayed in New York until I think she was quite elderly and not very strong, and then ended up in New Jersey where she had been born, uh, living with the nieces of Bret Hart. And that's a side story, because in California circles, there was said to be, although I think it was a created thing, there was said to be some uh, competitiveness between the two. He, of course, was a writer of short stories and poetry, and then he was the editor of the Overland Monthly, and she never had anything published in there. So her students who were loyal said, you know, it's because he knows that you know, he used your stuff and he doesn't want you, he doesn't want you in the limelight anymore. He famously wrote about the gold rush. So yes, yeah. And, but it, you know, I've looked at that and thought, did he plagiarize or didn't he? Well, the article that she wrote for the Canadian Women's Magazine, it's a discussion of plagiarism. <laughs> and... <laughs> And she, and she did bring Bret Hart up, and she said, well, you know, it's kind of the thing, can we put a trademark on language? Mm. You know, if you're describing the gold rush, or you're describing mm. some of these scenes, they were fairly specific. If there was a woman there, you know, things, there were certain specific themes, and she basically gave him a pass and just said, it doesn't matter. She never said, I forgive him. But she said, who knows, and ideas, creative ideas come from everywhere, and, you know, let's let it go, basically. And she, she did that in the, I think, the early 1880s when she was back in New York. So that's how she wrapped that up. And I don't Jealous. know that it was a make nice, but <laughs> right. she ended up uh, being taken care of by his nieces uh, for the rest of her life. And it was in that home, in the attic. Uh, she died in 1906, just before our big earthquake. And 15 years later, in 1922, a historian who was a mining historian went back to that house, and amazingly enough, in the attic was this photograph collection, were her mentor's letters that she had saved, were her friend's letters. That's what we have of Louise Clapp, you know, those things that were saved, that someone had the uh, amazing idea to go look. 
And 15 years later, you know, what do we do with our addicts? You know, will you give everything away or you shred it or that kind of thing? So it's quite remarkable that we have what we know about her. Now, there's a photo that's on the cover of the program magazine, which may or may not be of her. Is that right? Yes. I think I look at that and I try to imagine if that is Louise at the Feather River. It's certainly a woman dressed warmly. She's got a good warm cap on and a warm um, jacket with, I think, lamb's wool cuffs around it, so she's a little stylish, and then a big warm skirt. We don't know for sure. That picture is in the California State Library, and there's it. no one wrote on the back who it is and when it was taken. Always label your photographs. I used to nag that. That's right, oh. that's right. <laughs> but we could trace some things back to the family. Her uncle on her mother's side was mayor of New York for uh, one term, I think, and so his sketch shows up in biographical dictionaries. And also her niece, there are pictures of her niece, uh, the, the actress, the dancer. And you can see familiar characteristics. I do anyway. I'm not a forensic person. But you can look at the thick eyebrows that the uncle had and this young woman at the river had and the niece. And also the full lips. And, and the straight nose. So you look at those things, and I think if we ever have an opportunity, if I have more time, or anybody does, to let's look farther into photo collections, I do think we will know when we find her. I'm, I get goosebumps just thinking about it, because I think I will know. Mm. Now she, she kept um, copies of her letters, which is how they got published. Do, what's happened to them? Do we know? Basically? Those letters are also at the State Library. Oh, um, really? The original? Now, her letter, she, in her handwriting? None of her letters. In her handwriting, we have her art lectures, her literature lectures, and that kind of thing. So we know her handwriting. And um, the letters that we have are her collection of Alexander Hill Everett's letters to her, which are filled with amazing literature and history. of just a fabulous This is this thing. mentor of hers. Yeah, the did. mentor mm -hmm. of hers. And, um, and then the photographs. So we don't have anything Louise has written. So we don't know if we could go to Amherst. Uh, we might dig around and find things. There was a man I, I contacted, James Smith, interestingly enough, like me. He wasn't a Smith relative of Louise's. But he did, he did Amherst genealogy. So he's pulled the family together and, and went as far as he could with it. So there are ways of continuing the story. It's a matter of having time. So. Who knows what the future may bring? Maybe this opera will sort of spur more yes. mm -hmm. yes. investigation. Let me uh, ask the, uh, the same two questions of both of you, which are, um, what's your favorite letter of the 23? And um, if we could talk to Louis, like we could Skype her in right now, what would you want to ask her? <laughs> right. <laughs> Go first. Well, because nature is what brought me to believe in the Shirley letters and following that sense of her wonder at nature. It just, it just thrills me that she described it the way she does. Mm -hmm. Her last letter, when she knew that they were hurrying to leave and she said it would be madness to linger longer, she did a ritual closing thing. And I don't know whether this was an intentional literary um, device or quite what, but she, the last letter, she writes that she went out and stood in the moonlight and said farewell to the river and described this place where I have been so contented. You know, here, you, writing to her sister, you think it was such a crude, amazing place to be, but I have found peace here, and I go from here for a troubled and uncertain future. Mm -hmm. And that was how she concluded 15 months in a gold mining camp. Julia, is there a letter that sticks in your mind, or at least a passage from uh, from all these uh, writings of hers? I mean, I mean, the last letter is truly breathtaking. Um, I mean, there's so many <laughs> sections uh, throughout that. I mean, there's a lot of humor that Peter and John decided to set and highlight, um, along with these then moments of like being shaken by really stark reality. And um, that occurs throughout every one of her letters um, in kind of really s at surprising moments. Um, 
I can't. Uh, yeah, there's anyway. I don't know. I, I, can't, I guess I don't have a. She a does favorite really letter. Di quite vividly describe the violence and the and the racism uh, that that she sees. She uh, does, and and the the. The, oh, I, there's just so I don't know. There's so many wonderful yeah, passages. Yeah. I really can't. It is hard. You know, just if you could them ask her, enjoy them all. The <laughs> question you could ask her, like, why did you say this? Or is there anything that you would love to know if you could talk to her? Mm. Yeah, I'm. She spent so much time describing everyone else, <laughs> um, and she didn't really spend a lot of time talking about herself and I, I guess uh, I'd want to know if she just wanted to how how she would like to characterize herself because in a way I, I mean I guess in a way she chose this alter ego of Dame Shirley this brilliant brilliant observer um, who wasn't an activist per se um, so I, I'm kind of I'm curious, actually, what was different between the Louise Clapp that she that she felt she truly was versus the woman who she wanted to project. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me that um, uh, she uses this uh, eloquence and this literary flair in these brutal surroundings, and part of me thinks that she did that as a way of of kind of maintaining her sanity, to sort of uh, grasping onto civilization uh, that she had known before. What would you ask her, if you could? I would ask her, briefly, give us some hints about the marriage. Because I'd, like <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know, you know, what went wrong, or, I, you know, not my business, of course, but I would be curious about that. But my other question would be, were you lonely? Were you lonely there? Because there weren't many other women. Of course, she had the role of writing. The express man would come once a month and take her letters away and, and get them mailed and that sort of thing. She kept copies, obviously. But I wonder if it was a lonely life among the men and herself. There was really no one. There were no other women except briefly. The 4th of July scene, there were some other women, and she noted their fashions and that kind of thing. But basically... <laughs> She was a solitary woman, and that may be part of the answer, that I think she sort of led a solitary life. Um, but I would be interested in that. You have a kind of a musical moment where she goes on about that. It can help me with the language. No balls, no visiting, no, yeah. call, no calling, right. uh, no, no dinners. Sh no charades. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. There must and, no, be. and no new books. That was another right. thing. Right. No little tea drinkings and no church, no walks, you know, no strolling about town, that kind of thing. Because, yeah. I mean, it was also unsafe for her to be out a lot on her own. You know, it's just a reality, so... Yeah, um, probably unsafe in general, but uh, mm -hmm. especially to yeah. be, be alone. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think we need to let our audience uh, ask uh, some questions here. I'll try to repeat it just in case uh, you, you can't hear it. Who has a question for either of these interesting ladies? Yes, go ahead. Surroundings. How long was Dame Shirley there in the gold country? She was there from August of 1851 until November of 1852, so basically about 14 months. Including one long winter. <laughs> yes, including the very long winters, yeah, long cold winters. So it's not surprising they got out before the next winter came along. Yeah. Well, Faye had, Faye had, had been somewhere treating a patient or doing something, and so they were. she was worried because the postman said, I'm leaving. Whoever's coming with me is coming with me, but I'm not waiting around. So, so there was that tension about, uh, about leaving that winter. Anybody else with a question? Yes, go ahead. Two parts. The first is to say thank you to both of you. I taught California literature and used, of course, your book. And I saw you performing in concert a year and a half or so ago. And so you're, I'm a fan of both. I have a question. There's another California girl I'm really fond of. Her name is Ramona. And her, the woman who created her, it is, I think is from Amherst. She was great childhood friends with Emily Dickinson, of all people. Might their paths have crossed in any way, do you think? Uh, Louise's, as maybe as a young girl, and um, Helen Hunt Jackson? You know, that's a very interesting question. Helen Hunt Jackson, as you know then, um, and her baby, I 
think her husband was still in New York. They were coming back from Italy during a storm. The ship hit the shoals or something like that, and they went down. And interestingly enough, and I think that, you know, the climate in, uh, in New England or Boston, what have you, was public lectures. You know, that's how people got their ideas, knew who to read, knew who was, you know, kind of um, <clears throat> leading ideas. And I know that Louise was interested in that. I think that's where you get the, uh, the hints of transcendentalism in that last letter. In the 1922 edition that you showed of that, I believe that is where there is a poem that Louise wrote about losing Helen Hunt Jackson. She talked about that death was a theme for Louise. You can I've seen it in other places that are in print, so it's easy to, it's easy to see that. And just coming to California and getting that news, because Helen Hunt Jackson, I think it was 1848 or 1849 when she died, and then Louise lost her younger sister on that ship, and she wrote about that, just kind of the young death and losing you and that kind of thing. So I, other than that, all I could say is she might have done, she might have read and pro probably did read Helen Hunt Jackson and may have listened to her in talks and that sort of thing. That's as far as we know right now. Who else? Anybody in the back there? Yes. Is there a microphone coming around? <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for your <laughs> microphone duty here. <laughs> yes, I just have a question for the opera, because one of the scenes in the beginning of the letters is describing one of the funerals of the woman who dies, and it's a very stark scene. And one of the things that gets me in that reading that letter is that her her young daughter is laughing while they're over there in the house for the funeral. Mm. Do you remember that, uh, yes. that letter? Yeah. Um, yes, that was almost as soon as Louise arrived at the camp, so that had to be startling. The woman was Nancy Bailey, and in real life, she and her husband were the proprietors of the Humboldt, and I think it seems as though she died of a ruptured appendix. I think there was peritoneus, or however you say that word. And Louise was very touched. She wrote about the description of, you know, taking the the, the um, uh, casket up on a hillside. Dame Dame Shirley, um, Nancy Bailey was buried on the hillside. There is a headstone there. Um, you're, you shouldn't go up there now because I don't think it's safe because of, you know, growth and gold mining and that sort of thing. But there is a headstone there. But afterwards, Louise was just so struck that Nancy's little girl didn't get it. And of course she didn't. She was three, probably. And it, it, you know, it wouldn't sink in for a long time. But it's clear that Louise, you know, that took her back into her own past and probably seeing her younger sisters and so forth. Very poignant, very, uh, very compassionate, sad. That scene is not in the opera. No. Uh, well, there's sort of a lot of things in the, in the letters that there's Plenty of room for another opera <laughs> and all that material. Anybody else with a question? Let's go over here. Uh, yes, um, I'm wondering whether Louise might have been a, a, uh, a partial inspiration for Wallace Stegner in Angle of Repose. Yeah, Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose, which has been turned into an opera we performed at San Francisco Opera in 1976. Is there any connection there that you know of? I don't think there is. I've just been reading that. Um, someone else suggested that to me. And I think that he takes that strictly from his own family letters. Uh, it, may, it may be fictionalized or novelized uh, family biography. He talked about the New Almaden mines in San Jose, but they were so different from the gold rush. And I don't I haven't finished it, but I so far have not seen any any sense that he, you know, built a portrait around her. I recall that the novel switches back and forth from the Gold Rush era to the 1970s. Isn't that right? There's a, kind of a, a dual time thing going yeah, on there. Yeah. Angle of repose refers to the the slant at which a rock will rest rather than sliding down the hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Go ahead. Scene. Drunken nightmare in the, in the mob scene, and uh, there's just such a sense of outrage of what had happened, and yet at the end, the Dana May is waxing eloquently about the grandeur of the mountains, which isn't a modern sensitivity of how to deal with 
something so horrible and tragic. Mm. So I was wondering, did she say anything critical in her letters about what actually happened? Oh, yeah. yes, she, she does did. describe, uh, she, she describes, did. for example, the whipping of what, what she calls yeah. Spaniards. That's her term yes. for the uh, yeah. South Americans. Yeah. And, and sh expresses her shock. Uh, in fact, there, the, you have a language, a, a line about um, who could believe that in the 19th century that men could be beaten like dogs. Right. That's straight out of the letters. The, yeah, and even the line afterwards, which is sung by Ramon, um, she essentially says, and it, <laughs> again, paraphrasing, the effects of being violently attacked actually creates a need to retaliate and a need to kill mm -hmm. all Americans and that that indelible mark he'll have for the rest of his life. And so, um, and actually I find that the last epilogue, um, it's just about one's ability to continue shifting perspective, even in times when, well, <laughs> instead of getting stuck in a moment, you're actually able to step back, look, I mean, just and gaze everywhere. So I, I um, which is, I, it is one way to, to deal with trauma. And no, it's not, it's not an, again, the activist way. Um, in that way, I know it's, some people have said she's disappointing, but I don't know if we could have taken, you know, if, if historians can look at her writing with such respect, if she had been so, directly involved, um, that role of the observer is very critical. There's a certain amount of poetic license mm -hmm. we should point out. Uh, Louise Clapp was not a witness to the hanging of Josefa Segovia and uh, probably didn't even know about it. Um, she, I so, think she did. Uh, she might not have witnessed it. I've forgotten that detail, but all the violence, you know, there, that wasn't the only hanging. There was someone else who, some, they advised him, I think he was accused of stealing gold, and he was advised to plead innocent. And this is the vigilante justice uh, where the mob ruled. And he said, it doesn't make any difference whether I plead innocent or guilty, I'm being hung anyway. And Louise's response through those letters and through that violence, she was shocked. As you said, she could not believe how men could treat each other, and it was horrifying to her to see all that violence. That comes through in the letters. And, I, and she said in the letters also that I promised you I would give you a true and faithful accounting mm -hmm. of what I've seen, and mm -hmm. I hate to do this, but this is, right. this is what we see. Yeah, I'm just pulling a couple. Um, justice at the hands of a mob, however respectable is at best a fearful thing. And she says, uh, her lustrous skies gaze upon such barbarous deeds. Um, so she, she does talk about it quite a lot. I mean, it's not, uh, no, it's not in every moment, but <laughs> yeah. I think trying to cling to civilization in the midst of all this uh, mm -hmm. uh, brutality must have been a, a, a priority for her. Yeah, things that she had never seen before, obviously, and wouldn't go back to ever again. I saw a hand on the aisle back there. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, I had planned on seeing this opera, and um, last Thursday I saw Joshua Cosman's um, review in the Chronicle, and I was just, uh, I was surprised by it. And uh, again, I haven't seen the opera yet. I'm sure many in the room have. But I was just wondering if you'd have seen it and what your reaction to it was, if any. I always, uh, when I get a question like that, I, I love to quote Sir John Pritchard, who was our music director. Uh, back in the 1980s, and I was doing an interview with him like this. He's an Englishman, of course. And I said, John, do you read reviews? And he says, oh, yes. When I was a young man, I won't try to do his accent, but uh, <laughs> he said, I would rush out, you know, early in the morning and get the newspaper, and I'd be devastated. And I learned that um, the thing to do was to wait a month. And if you, <gasps> you read the review a, a month later, and it's Oh, isn't that funny? You know, you, you get a, a certain perspective on it. So that I would suggest maybe you know, wait a month and read that review again. Um, Julie, guess, what, do you ever read re reviews? Do you pay any attention? I read every review, and part of it is because it lets me know where I'm most sensitive and the things I need to resolve within myself before the next performance. Um, I, I guess if you can perceive, you know, whatever your synthesis is of the opera or of John's music, I mean, that's, it is, I, I, I can't speak for Joshua Kosman. Um, 
But I do feel that well, one thing that I was a little perturbed by is that he was discouraging of people to come see this. And I feel that there is a responsibility for those who are writing about the arts right now, and partic particularly that um, whatever your feeling is of the piece, it's like just still try to get people into the hall <laughs> to experience yeah. it, and then just whatever your reaction is, you know. But the, there is a there's a very um, violent <laughs> response to this piece. Um, he had a very violent response to the piece, and it, it was a very violent time, and maybe, I don't know what chords that struck in him that um, were so disarming and infuriating for him, but yeah, it was, ah, it's very strong language, it really was. <laughs> but he did enjoy the performers anyway. <laughs> there are uh, lots of other reviews that uh, have been, you know, a variety of uh, viewpoints. So. When I read that, I was disappointed. I was very disappointed, but, he, and I've forgotten the phrase he used to describe Dame Shirley's name, and he used some, like, why would anybody write with such a corny name or something like that? And I realized then he knew nothing about 19th century literature or San Francisco. Anybody who wrote, we all recognize Mark Twain, but anybody who wrote, you know, John Rollins was Yellow Bird and, and Stephen Massett was James Pipes of Pipesville. Everybody had a name. That's just how you did. And um, so I thought, well, you know, he doesn't have the full background of this. And then for myself, I thought, well, this is interesting. So when I go, we're going to, we're going to go to the very final matinee performance, and I'll see what I think. You know, now I know what he thinks. That doesn't tell me what I have to think. It tells me, you know, I will look and kind of bounce that off and see how I respond to it. So in a way, I thought it was kind of valuable, even though it was negative. So I just turn it around. And if he'd said it was wonderful, then OK, you go and you sit there, and everything is wonderful. So, <laughs> so that was my take. I'm just kind of ignoring the side of the room. Does anybody over here that I've neglected? Yes, sir, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we close on December 2nd, uh, 10th rather, and then it will eventually go to um, Amsterdam. Uh, the Netherlands Opera is a partner in this. And then uh, it then goes to Dallas, not I think until 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Pardon? Did I say something wrong? 2021, is it? And um, there is another potential European partner who has not been um, officially <laughs> confirmed yet. And, uh, but as with um, the other uh, operas of, of John Adams, I'm sure that other companies will, will leap in. When we did Dr. Atomic, it was a, a, a single company commission. We didn't have any partners, but oh, it, wow. that's gone all over the place. So yeah. that, that will mm -hmm. probably happen with this as well. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so stylistically its own. And I'm just wondering about your process and how you approach this music because mm -hmm. it's so different from the traditional mm -hmm. uh, literature and you know the characters and um, how mm -hmm. you really command the performance. Mm -hmm. How do you integrate all that? What's your what's your process when you get into roles? I hope you all heard that question. Wonderful question. Mm -hmm. How do you approach learning John Adams music? Um it's very organized and disciplined. So I take the rhythm um, and the text and learn that separately. I mean, I really kind of do this with all material, but it's particularly important for Adams. Um, and try to get that as fluid, open, easy in my mouth as <laughs> and body as possible. Um, I learn then the... Uh, melodies, which are all so fantastic. I mean, John really writes great tunes, and um, you have to have all parts of your voice accessible to you at all times. Um, <laughs> like, any moment, any moment. I mean, the range of my role is from a low F sharp to a high D flat, um, and which is crazy extreme. I, actually, I don't know any other role in the operatic repertoire that's that wide. Um, so I, I, I really take my time um, 
just processing <laughs> each of those things separately. And then I just kind of layer them on. I mean, my, my uh, boyfriend is here, and he's, <laughs> he sees me as I'm working on these things, and I will go from phases of, oh, this is so wonderful, to impossible, impossible material. And I'm just like, I hate you, John Adams, and I'm furious <laughs> at you, Peter Sellers. I mean, it's really a, it's a furious, <laughs> um, a very uh, wild, um, Go, go around with the material, but when you piece it all together, um, I've actually ended up, I've found that I've done some of my best singing with John Adams' music because I've had to really just find my voice and see how it resonates in my body um, and to make all of the all the pitches easy and um, natural. Um, yeah, and that's great. There's no if you try to falsify a moment of this, it just, it, or put on any veil at all in the sound or in the delivery, it's, it's just done. There's no, <laughs> you can't receive actually what John's written. Um, you wouldn't consider yourself a, a new music specialist, is that right? I mean, you do a lot of it, but it's yeah. not your no, only thing. No, I mean, I just yeah, do, do what speaks to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not expecting to concentrate on on new pieces exclusively uh, no. going forward. No, no. Mm. And obviously, you'll get asked uh, because you've done them um, so well. So. Yeah. Is there another question before we wrap it up here? Mm. Yes, ma'am. I wonder what the language of the it wasn't all of the um, libretto f from the book itself. All of mine is. Uh -huh. um, there's also poetry. Um, there's Mark Twain, Frederick Douglass. There's some a wonderful Chilean uh, poet that is all Alfonsina the. Alfonsina Storni. Yeah. The, so almost everything that the character Jose Segovia, Segovia says, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in Spanish, is the poetry of this wonderful mm -hmm. uh, Argentinian poet. So, so oh, was that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> was, was that kind of language very different from the type of language you're used to singing? It's still English, no. <laughs> I mean, so much of what I sing, so much of the repertoire in general is poetic. So, um, no, I mean, it's, this is, I think this is pretty clear narrative, actually. Yeah, not a lot of uh, metaphors, really. <laughs> Actually, there are a lot of minor songs that are the texts of the that, everything yes. the chorus sings, and, and a lot of what the character Joel Cannon sings That's are from right. from and minor just, songs, and they're kind of earthy and mm -hmm. and uh, kind of anti poetic. And, and some ancient Chinese. Yes, poets, uh, the character Ah Sing. Well. What she sings, a lot of it is poetry, uh, Chinese poetry from the Gold Rush, uh, translated into English. One more question, then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've kind of. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, I I find it really helpful to work on a lot of different kinds of repertoire at one time because it keeps well, one, it keeps my mind activated, um, and it keeps my voice very facile. Um, so I yeah I I I don't know if what the differences are I I I think it'll be interesting now like actually going I just gave a master class today at the conservatory and um, going through um, some Mozart recitative and I just kept saying closer to speech please closer to speech you're just speak it's you're speaking on pitch um, otherwise you get this weird removed. <laughs> It's like, instead of just, you, you, it's like you're playing an opera singer instead of just being one. That's what I, I found myself saying today. Um, There's this artificiality, that, that yeah, the falseness yeah, there. Yeah, when really you just, you just want a human expression. So, so we, I don't know the, if I answered that question at yeah, all. But. I, would, I would guess and, and, um, the, the, the agility that's required for a, like a handle roll or a bel canto roll. Um, it, it helps, it translates to doing um, modern music, which is... Uh, Interestingly, though, like, the coloratura in 
uh, and all of the melismatic work that's in Dr. Atomic, there isn't any in this uh, for me. Um, but that is some of the most difficult melismatic material that I've ever worked on. Uh, and he's he helped me, <laughs> John, John helped me get better at it. So that's nice. <laughs> um, we've uh, sort of given these ladies the, the amount of time that we promised them. And I think it's time to thank them very much for being here. Marlene and Julia, thank you all for coming. Thank you.